Hello everyone, my name is Corazar, and welcome back to the Vintage Story Guide. We are back in the world on this cold and sunny day, but you will see that although it is freezing out, and I have just come back from a trek up to visit our clothing trader here, with actually no results, I was looking for more linen and he had none, I am still nice and toasty. So yes, this, uh, this fur coat and everything is really paying off. Now, in between episodes, we did a couple things, or I did a couple things. One is, I had a light temporal storm, where about three drifters spawned the entire time. We got, where is it, we got one rusty gear, and we got three flax. That was it. However, I did go to our transicators, here and here, and I went to the other sides of them, and I collected all the things in the chests and all of the interesting non-clutter blocks on the ground. And I have them in here. And here's what we got. We got seven more metal parts. We got an aged crate opened. Some more lime, some more sphalerite, some more closed aged crates, some more metal scraps, some more flint, granite stones, two parsnip seeds, three spelt seeds, a tuning cylinder of the invention, a painting, our very first painting, and only so far, and a broken blackguard helm. Now, you may have noticed my excitement when we first found this a couple episodes ago. That's because, while this is kind of useless armor right now, when we hit the Iron Age, this will become some of the best armor we can get. Because the blackguard and the Forlorn Hope armor sets provide the same protection as Iron Plate, but with far lower drawbacks. You have better healing, you're not as hungry, your speed and accuracy both don't drop as much. So this is actually pretty cool. Now, we won't do anything with it yet because, again, it is in a very bad, broken state. But we can go ahead and hang our painting, I think, over our door. Because the forest is that direction, and there are trees here. So yeah, there we go. Now, in today's episode, I have come to a decision about what to do. I was trying to figure out whether I wanted to chase animals or visit traders. I think we're going to go on a trader visit. Because I also want to go and stop by several ruins that we found, and also maybe come by some of these trees and collect some cuttings from them. Because these are fruit trees, we can then take their cuttings and plant them, and eventually some of those cuttings may grow up into full trees. So we can kind of do like a nice big loop here, visit some ruins, visit some trees, visit some traders, come over this way, maybe even open up some of the map down here a little bit. Visit these ruins here, which I've marked on the map as well. More fruit trees, more traders, and just generally make our way around the map that we know and visit all the traders we see, visit all the ruins we see. Maybe not this one because it's a bit cold. That might make us a little too chilly. And just catalog our traders and ruins and bring back some bony soil. And in the meantime, I'm going to answer some of your 20 questions because I am still working through my backlog, but I think I might be able to catch up with today's episode. Now, as far as what to bring, I'm going to bring along our falx, our bow, our torches, which I'll keep off the bar in case we fall in water. I'm going to bring along some rusty gears so that if we run into traders that have fun stuff for us to buy, we can buy it. I'm going to bring both kinds of ladders because these are handy for dropping down to check out a cave real quick and then pulling back up. And these are better for more permanent installations. And then some usual tools, pickaxe, prospecting pick, shovel, axe, and so on. I do have spare pickaxes and some other odds and ends in here, including some dry grass and some firewood for building a fire in case we do fall into deep water and get wet, because even with our nice new clothes, it might still kill us. Anyway, since it is getting on toward nightfall, I am going to rest here for the evening, and then in the morning, we'll set out. I'm also going to grab a bed from our overhead storage, as I just realized I forgot to grab one, and then that will be everything that we need to go. I also have a full pot of red meat stew with some onions, and the red meat stew was kind of lucky because a ewe got trapped in our drifter trap over there and was some easy pickings. Anyway, I'll see all of you in the morning. Alright folks, it is morning, or near enough. Let's be off. Anyway, I hope you enjoy my answers to your 20 questions as we're on the way and dodging rifts, apparently. And also you'll note that, yes, we are starting at 742, 
but it's still pretty dim out. It's not dark dark, but it ain't bright either. And yes, that is because Vintage Story has realistic sunup and sundown times. And wolves galore. So, let's get this party started. It's time, folks. Time for more 20 coup questions. You guys have been relentless in posing new and creative questions, so let's get started. Becca M asks, and I'm paraphrasing this one, but was it hard to start your channel? How do you go about editing videos? Starting a channel isn't hard. Sticking with it is. Anyone with a YouTube account can upload videos, but to keep a channel going is constant work, even if it is just a hobby. I started with just some random Space Engineers videos I wanted to share with friends, and then thought I could have a long-running RimWorld series that ran for fewer episodes than I had fingers. It wasn't until I found something that I was really passionate about, in which I could stomach playing consistently, that the channel started to take off. As for recording and editing videos, I record at times when I'm actively working toward the topic of an episode and doing something interesting. Digging clay for the tenth time? Nah, not recording. But turning that clay into something new and interesting that we're talking about for the episode? Sure. Once I've covered the episode's topic or topics, I wrap it up with an outro and go edit and shortcut. There are a ton of tutorials on how to edit videos and whatever editor you use, so I won't go into that. Eddie Fesperman asks, Are there any upcoming sandbox or survival games that you're looking forward to playing? There are so many to keep track of. I've got a couple on my list. I recently bought Lens Island, but I also think it'd be fun to get into Ark Survival Evolved again. And also, Snakes Above just came out, and that is really interesting. Survival games are often a real commitment, though, so the guy would need to slow down or end before I add another huge time sink to the schedule. Alright, folks, here we are at the aforementioned fruit tree. This is a mature pear tree. Now, what we could do is we could wait for spring and summer to roll around and come in here and pick its fruit, but it's kind of far away. So you'd have to sort of come back and check and see about when we need to come back, and it's a bit of a hassle. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my axe. I'm going to prune these branches here, specifically, right here. Now it says stem, but these are actually branches here. Not sure why it says stem. But these should, yep, there are pear tree cuttings. Now, when we plant these, they will have a 40% chance to survive. And that means we're going to want to plant at least a few of them. And let's see, you're also a branch. There we go. If we had another tree already alive, we could attempt to graft the branches or cuttings onto the existing tree, but those only have a 5% chance of success. Now, we will leave this here. This tree will regrow its branches, and it might even grow taller, and maybe even grow a second row of branches. So if we do run out of pear tree cuttings in the future, which we probably won't, because they are basically everywhere, then we can come back and harvest this again, probably in a year or two. Okay, let's get back on the road and back down to... Well, not back down, but down to our good buddy there. I'm going to knock these off here. Alright, let's get rolling. Zafri asks, asks, why do you call the other block game the other block game? It's a community joke. Like, everyone knows what the other block game is, so I don't really have to say it. Do you? And here we are near this trader. I don't like the area he's in. This is probably a very wolf-prone area, or in my case, apparently. Rift. <laughs> What are you? You are an artisan trader. Okay. So artisans will buy gems. I think we've got a couple from our panning. And they'll buy both low, medium, and high gems. So you have to pay attention to what they actually want. So he wants mostly mediums except for low diamond. And I think we only have low peridots and emerald. They'll also buy some art supplies. Things like peat and blue clay and fire clay for firing those things. They'll buy nice and warm clothes. And they will sell you tapestries, flower pots, crocks, vessels, and planters, and occasionally other odds and ends too. Well, that's good to know. We're going to go ahead and we're going to update your mark here. Would you mind not pushing me out of your house? Thank you very much. There we go. We will unpin you. 
Yep, good. Good to meet you too, buddy. Alright, well, let's get back on the road. We're going to zip around here. I was going to go across here, but I think it's probably a, not as good of a way to go. We'll get wet doing that. And then we'll get over to these ruins over here. And the nearby trader. Derek, in all caps, asks, Have you ever considered doing a Vintage Story tutorial series with shorter, more targeted videos that cover specific topics? Actually, I am specifically staying away from that type of content. I started the guide series because, at the time, there were basically two kinds of Vintage Story videos. On the one hand, you had strict tutorial videos, often in a creative world, to explain exactly how a specific mechanic works. On the other, you had Let's Plays with players who often didn't have a great understanding of the game, or at least weren't explaining what they were doing. I wanted to create something to bridge the two. Tutorials from a practical perspective of how and when each mechanic fits into the survival aspects of the game. Crone22 asks, Do your cats usually get along? For the most part, Mew and Rex are at least on speaking or, or meowing terms with each other. Rex is both a playful dope and a bundle of anxiety, while Mew is judgmental and discerning, and not really interested in playing with Rex. They do play together occasionally, but Rex has a tendency to take things too far, and he weighs about 30% more than Mew, so she has to extract herself or cry for help sometimes. Okay, folks. We're getting pretty close to where we want to be, but it's getting dark, and it's getting... Well, it's very rifty. There's a bear over there, so I'm going to go ahead and dig us out a couple things. One is we're going to build a little shelter here. And by build, I mean we're going to dig out a little hole in the rock. We're just going to drop our bed in here. And we will seal ourselves in for the night. And I think I'm also going to go ahead and we're going to make a little bit of bear trap over here. And see if we can lure that black bear into it. Right here. And hopefully, if we fall in, and I'm going to put a couple ladders here, so we can maybe get out. Now we can jump right over that, so that's not a problem. Alright, let's get our lantern out, and we're going to go ahead and see if we can try to lure this black bear over here. Assuming I can find him. Oh, hey, there he is. Hey, buddy. Come get some. Ooh, I'm right here. Do I really have to do it? Come on. Oop, there he is. Boop! Come on, dude. Yeah, we're gonna go around this hole till you fall in. There we go. Problem solved. Okay. There's one threat taken care of. Next threat is the knight. It is a medium rift night, so I'm going to go ahead and rest, and I'll see all of you in the morning. Okay, good morning, folks, although I know you can't tell it's morning yet, but it is. I mean, there's a clock up there, too. And I did just wanted to note that we have come across some claystone rock here. So this is a different color rock. It's another sedimentary stone type, and... I like the look of it, especially when you polish it. You can polish rocks with, well, if you relieve the whole rock, you can polish it with a hammer and chisel. And this makes a really nice, warm, kind of brownish orange color. I really like it. But I wanted to show you that I am using the pro pick wherever I can, whenever we sort of stop to catch our breath, which was not in here with all the bears. But here we have some very high sphalerite, or high sphalerite, and some bismuthonite, which is for bismuth. We've also got some lignite, and right actually near here, I did detect some galena, like within eight blocks of here. So that is something to take note of for later on, I believe. Yeah, we have some daylight. Oh, there's some lignite up there. Look at that. So we have claystone, sandstone, chert, slate, and andesite. That's a pretty good set of stones right there. And that bear's hanging out in its little pen over there. We're going to dodge around that. I think we're going to go probably around this way and head up to the different ruins. I actually found another ruin right over here. 
so we'll go there first. Anyway, back to the questions. Autumn Edruka asks, How do you stay with single-player worlds for so long? I enjoy playing with friends and watching Let's Plays, but I get bored so fast when I play single-player worlds and games. The trick is, of course, you start playing and you just never stop. No, but really, the answer is that I had the same problem as you before I started the guide series back in 2022. I have found that having a reason to play and produce videos generally keeps me invested in the game. But you probably may have noticed if you watched my last season that around episode 108 we ended. And actually, on that 108 we ended. And part of that, sure, was that 1.18 was coming out, but also it was just time, you know? Leon Oliviera asks, do you like the random weather of the Rusty Gear server, or do you prefer the more go south for warm areas realistic weather? Personally, I'm not a fan of the patchy climate setting, because it doesn't work well for hot climates in cold latitudes. The tropical fruit trees will all die off in the first winter, and their crops are generally only plantable for a tiny portion of the year. Give me realistic climate or get out. Thea Niktos says, Your desktop background is beautiful. Is it from anything? Oh yeah, I love it. It's just something I found on DeviantArt, called Bonsai Tree by Cloir. That's K-L-O-I-R, in case you want to go get it yourself. Well, 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 look at this. We have olivine right on the surface. That is getting marked. Olivine is a neat substance. It can be used to make green glass, but it also has uses later on in the game when you are getting into steel making. So we will come back and ransack that later. You can also occasionally find peridot stones in it. So let's go ahead and see what we find here. Just olivine. Okay, that's fine though. And you know what? While we're here... Ultra high bismuthonite and decent cassiterite. So, when we need to get some bismuth or some tin, and we're gonna want some tin here real soon, then we know right where to go. Very good to know. Okay, back to oof. Ruins, smack dab in the middle of wolf territory. I'm gonna call this Wolftopia. Alright, back to your questions. Don Zakane has two questions, and they ask, You mentioned Seven Days to Die at some point in a video. What was your first reaction to the Blood Moon? I was definitely very nervous in my first Blood Moon. I think that was back in Alpha 11 or 12, I think, maybe even earlier, and I understand the game has evolved quite a bit since those days. I wasn't as surprised about it as I could have been since I got into the game along with a friend who showed me the ropes and or spoiled basically every secret or surprise the game had to offer. Don Zakane's second question is, are you a dad? I laugh hard at your dad jokes, so you must be certified. It's cyan magically proven that non-dads can't rock the dad jokes. Ding, ding, ding! You are actually the first person to ask this kind of question regarding my personal life. So, let the floodgates open. I am indeed a dad, and not just a cat dad. My wife and I currently have one adorable and amazing daughter who was born in 2021. My wife says I was born a dad. I've been cracking the dad jokes since well before we met. Crone22 has another question. What is the deal with the green stone in the picture of that guy? The green stone, of course, is peridotite, or peridwite, since apparently I've been saying it wrong forever. The guy is Dwight Schrute from the American version of The Office. He's a handful, but hilarious. Hence, peridwite. Sean Blackburn asks, if you had to choose between a colors update that would add dye options to plaster and other blocks like ceramics, or a cooking and herbology centric one, which would you take first? The correct answer to this is yes, I'll take both please. Though, in reality, I think if I had to choose just one, I'd go with the dyes for additional colors. It's difficult to make a vibrant painting in Vintage Story because most colors in the game are muted due to being pure stone and unfinished wood. We have here a pink apple tree with a hog underneath it. I happen to like pink apple trees a lot. They are very good for productivity, so let's go ahead and we're going to harvest some of these branches.
Let's go check out this tree then. And yet, so since we haven't been in the area in a while, it was entering dormancy. Okay, here, this one apparently was loaded in. Ooh, we have some quartz here. I can come and get some of these later on for more glass. But the trees will go through this cycle. And sometimes if they aren't loaded in in a while, they will end up kind of like trying to catch up, which can be kind of funny. Let's see what you are. You're awful high up here. I'm going to guess a pear tree. No, you're a cherry tree. Okay. What we're going to do is let's go ahead and we're going to... Yeah, we'll harvest. Ooh, you know what? We need to drop something here. We're going to drop this fire clay that we don't really need seven pieces of. And we'll get this. Are you? Yes, your branch. So if you break a branch that something else is on top of it, we'll break the others on top of it. So we now have two cherry branches. Three cherry tree cuttings. Okay, nice. All right, let's go and visit this merchant here, this trader. And this one looks like it has a pretty big cart. So I might be tempted to stay the night in his cart. Maybe after I run up here and get a tippy tap from a cave or something, or a rock face. You have a nice bright light out front. You are a survival goods trader. Okay. Hey, Axe. I might still be dreaming. Got anything to trade, buddy? Here we go. So if we didn't have the resources to make our fur-lined gear, we could have come here and bought some from him. Now, it is kind of pricey. Nine and seven gears. But we do have plenty of money on us, so we could have, we needed to. Oh, he has the full set, too. Very nice. Now, also, he will sell lots of fun things, like bronze arrows, which are better than the arrows we have. Our arrows deal zero additional damage. These deal one and a half extra on top of the bow's damage. He also has a black bronze pickaxe. And these guys will sell pickaxes, they'll sell bows. He's got lime, he has a wolf pup. And ooh, some very fancy shields that are a bit better than our current one. And honestly, if you're making shields or you need a, a nice shield that's not the Blackguard shield or the one that we have, I would just come buy them. And a bismuth bronze spear. And a nice black bronze phallus. Very cool. And these guys will buy bread, leather, lanterns, sewing kits, wax twine, ingots, different things. So they'll actually sort of buy a lot of the sort of things that you make a lot of around the house. So when we need gears and we need a lot of gears, I'll probably bake a lot of bread and come sell it here. Maybe even some leather too eventually. Okay, well, let's see. It is getting kind of dark. I'm going to go ahead and swap this out. And wait, do you have a bed? You do. I'm going to come hang out with you for the evening. Let's go right up here. I think I see a little cavey thing I can slip into. Or is it a tree? It might be a tree. That's a tree. Hmm, I do want to get a tip tap from here though. So. In areas where I can't find a really easy spot to, like, drop into a cave and take a couple samples, what I'll do is I'll just sort of drill down. There's some sand. So what I'll do is let's just go up to, say, here. I'll break this grass. And I'll just dig down to the first layer of stone. It's pretty far down there. And I will take my tap. And hope that this is not one block thick. Okay. I'll come over four squares, so one, two, three, and four, and I'll do it again. And of course, one more time, one, two, three, and four. This is four, right? One, two, three, yes. And here we go. Ultra high bismuthonite and very poor cassiterite and minuscule magnetite. Okay. Good to know. Right, well, it is getting very dark. I'm going to do some map reviewing in the middle of the night. And I'm also going to remark that cherry tree, because it is not a purple tree, it is a cherry tree. So yep, I'm going to check out the map and see if there's anything new to spot, since so we've uncovered some more land. I'm gonna redo this guy as a survival goods trader, and then I will rest and I'll pick back up in the morning. I'll see you all then. Okay, everyone, it is morning-ish. And we're going to head out here. We're going to head across this way here. I'm thinking over up here, hopefully. 
and we'll go visit these fruit trees and then this trader and then from there we'll sneak our way up to this trader here and beyond we'll see how far we get I, I kind of want to swing south here just to take a trek through this sort of peridotite, peridotite gravel area and see what there is to see so we might do that too let's get a move on and I'll get back to your questions Garrett McGill asks, Do you have anything special in mind for the type of building style you want to use in this season of the guide series? Like any kind of style you haven't used before? I'm interested to see what you can do with the new support beams in particular. I do have a building style in mind. We're still in the early game, so it hasn't come out yet because, hint hint, we're going to need a decent number of pickaxes, and at least some glass, so we need to advance to the Bronze Age before we can make much progress on our final house. I'm also reconsidering whether I want to build right here, or explore beyond our transicators to see if there is better train out there. No spoilers on what the season style will be, though. Critical Pixel asks, Do Cooper's reeds grow faster when put next to or into water? This is a common misconception, but no. They have a set timer and can grow anywhere as long as it's above freezing. I'm not even sure they require light. Trav asks, What are the main benefits and features of the Bronze Age? It seems almost just like a temporary stepping stone between copper and iron. You know, I kind of agree with that. The Bronze Age is rather ill-defined. The Copper Age is too, since you can often skip right over it if you find bronze tools, or get lucky early on with Considerate, or just buy them from a trader. But here's a brief list of things you can do in the Bronze Age that you can't do in the Copper Age. One is you can mine quartz, along with gold and silver that it may contain. You can mine borax and anthracite coal. You can build hellhammers to automate the production of metal plates and iron ingots when you do advance to the Iron Age. You can build pulverizers to crush certain materials into usable dyes. You can chop down several tropical trees, such as purple hearts. You can also craft certain items that require bronze, such as the clockmaker's spear and most of the new mechanical gear you can get from following the game's storyline. And of course, you also can't mine iron ore without bronze. There may be some other bronze-only features in the game, but these are the big ones, in my opinion. Okay, folks, we have made it through an unstable area to this place, and this guy has a resonator. I think I might know what kind of crater this is. But I've been wrong before. However, oh, you're a furniture trader. I thought you'd be luxuries goods, given you have two resonators. You rich person, you. Hello. Hello, Lynn, the furniture trader. Uh, let's do the... Yeah, I think so. What do we get to trade? Yes, the furniture trader. So I've actually been looking for one of these guys. Oh, he'll buy... Or they'll buy nails and strips for two for one gear. It's not a great deal. If you have a luxuries goods trader, you can actually make a small profit buying the glass from the luxuries goods and selling it to the furniture traders. These guys will sell paintings and tables and fences and shelves, some sort of mundane things you can craft, barrels and so on. But they'll also sell these sleek doors. Now, the sleek doors used to be the normal door design, but they only came in one color. As of this version, you can no longer build them yourself, you must buy them. And wow, they're expensive. That's... I don't really like that. <laughs> I really miss the old sleek doors, the regular doors because you could actually see through them. But I think, I think at some point this person's going to get our business because I want some of these doors. Okay, well, it's good to know. Okay, so we have one more trader, and then we have a few more ruins to go, and I'll visit this guy and hopefully buy some linen, because I do want some extra bits here and there. So, oh, oh right, this is the guy we're going for. So we'll go ahead and mark you. I'm just going to unpin you. Okay, let's go back to your questions. Ryuga asks, What food items or cooking methods would you add to Vintage Story? Personally, I'm pretty happy the way it is, but if I were to add more, I would want to see some more food preservation methods along with cold meals. There's a mod for drying meat and some other features, but it would be nice to have it in the vanilla game. Along with maybe preparing rice and fish with some vinegar to make sushi, and sandwiches. 
crept it in the grid with a loaf of bread, plus one to three servings of cooked meat, or fish, or vegetables and fruit, and peanut butter and jelly, of course. Poppersnot asks, why do you procrastinate answering these questions for so long? Oh, no reason aside from certain people who belong in comment jail. Okay, traitor. Traitor, traitor. Wow. Neat little place. I could see like a self-contained base being built there. What do you have for us? You are a building materials trader. Okay. Uh -huh. I've seen worse guys in a trade. Well. This is his name, not like, well. So, building materials traders, they will buy... Oh, closed aged crates. Not too bad. Bad price, but that's okay. They'll buy hammers and saws and things for making building materials. As well as, I guess, some jewelry and some lighting. And they'll sell you all kinds of blocks. Now, ooh, plaster. Oh man, that's an expensive price for plaster. They will sell you things that you can't even make yourself. Like wallpaper at an exorbitant price. I mean, this is... This is, well, 16, I guess, for 4 gear or 6 gears isn't too, too bad. But man, I think previously they weren't in stacks of 16. But you can buy plaster, or you can make it. You can buy some kinds of polished stones, shingles. They will sell you occasionally red and brown bricks or shingles. And this is the only way to get those color of bricks and shingles. Now, the fire clay and the blue clay, we can make ourselves. But, yeah. So, these guys are pretty handy to have. I'm going to mark him down. So, we have rounded out. Let's see, we have agriculture. We have clothing. We have artisan survival goods, furniture, and building materials. And that is six. I believe there are, there's eight or nine types. I think we're missing the commodity goods, treasure hunter, and the luxuries goods. But hopefully we will come across them sooner rather than later. Okay, well, I'm going to spend the night here and wait till it's nice and bright out. We're going to go and ransack Probably these four ruins. I might skip this one because, again, it's winter, and or it's almost winter, and I don't want to end up getting too, too cold. Ooh, fun. All right, folks, I will see all of you in a little bit. Okay, folks, it is morning, and there are many voices outside. We're going to basically just book out of here. See you, gang. Oh, we're going the wrong way. There's a very frosty drifter. Look at that. Yeah, you're gonna come throw stones at me? You're just made of ice. Wow. I'd say poor guy, but I don't know about that. Now, we are actually starting to get a little chilly here. Because we spent the night in a very cold and high elevation cart. So once we get down here, I'm going to set up a little fire. I guess I'm gonna wait till we're starting to freeze a little more. And then we'll go ahead and build a fire, because I want to get as much ground between us, or as much ground covered between us and our next destination as possible, as soon as possible. Nanu Nanu 365 asks, and I'm paraphrasing for clarity here, but previously you mentioned that you like the difficulty of finding and using translocators, but also wanted some kind of player-built fast transportation. Is there some kind of middle ground, like ley lines or jaunts to the west world, or some kind of risk of danger that would make for a balanced experience? I think something like you mentioned with ley lines or similar is probably a solid middle ground, especially if it requires the player to spend a lot of time and resources mapping out these things. But that would also just be like another kind of prospecting, so it might feel a little samey. I think the simplest solution, in my opinion, would be to allow players to retune existing translocators to adjust their linkages along with the normal limitations on their travel distance, which is about 8 to 10 kilometers, if I recall. Also, Tyron has said he wants to implement other methods of transportation, so I'm happy to see how those play out, and adjust my opinions later. Oh, we have a neat little ruin here. Oh, nice. Oh, cool. Okay. 
some quartz, a bee nade. <laughs> Those of you who know, you know. Of course, we have some gears at the end there. I'm familiar with this particular design. Let's get our way through here and grab the gears over here. There we go. Now, this is something that I want to come back to. We're not going to dig up all this treasure here. I'll take what I can fit, but... Ooh, I don't know. What can I fit? You know what? The only thing I really want... There's only one blasting powder. It's not very useful. The only thing I really want is basically nothing. I'm going to mark this, and come back to it at a later time. Okay, let's be off again. Pitzahoot asks, Do you think Vintage Story is suitable for long, extensive worlds that you play for multiple years? Is that something you would consider? I would say that Vintage Story was suitable for long-lived worlds until 1.18. 1.18 introduced some pretty new game-altering content that required either recreating a new world entirely, or manually placing the new structure in the game, which doesn't sound like fun to me. It sounds like there are going to be more such structures added to the game in the upcoming releases, and unless it's possible to find them just by generating new landmass, then I think the same caveat goes for them. We'll have to see how this plays out, but I suspect that starting new worlds may generally be a necessity until that kind of development cools down. After all, Vintage Story is still an early access game. I'll put it this way, though. If 1.18 hadn't required a new world, I may have kept playing the first world. Not 100% for sure, but I would have considered it. We have a bear on our butts. Let's get chilly. I guess we're not getting that tree then, are we? Wow. He came out of nowhere. Well, you can't rest anywhere around here, can you? Anna Chibi asks, Do you have any tips or checklist for picking a place to call home? I think each person's checklist is going to be quite different, at least as far as terrain goes. Even within one world, you might have different requirements for what and how you want to build a particular build in. But in general, I recommend the following. First, build in the climate that you want. If you want to farm your round and be surrounded by a green jungle, then you gotta head south. If you're crazy and you want snow year-round, head north. Second, make sure the surface and probably five or six blocks below the surface of where you're building is reasonably stable, temporally speaking. You don't want to go crazy and die in your own home. Third, search for the terrain you want to build in. Vintage Story is pretty unforgiving and requires effort to do things like terraforming, so you want to keep that to a minimum. If you want to build in a flat plane, don't build it. Go find it. If you want to build in a mountain, go find a mountain. Lastly, settle somewhere that has the resources you need to get started within about 500 blocks to maybe a kilometer or so, depending on how dangerous the terrain is. This means trees, clay of both types, and at least medium fertility soil, unless you enjoy pain. If you've already been playing in your moving house and can bring tree seeds and terra preta with you, this isn't as important though. Everything else can kind of come after. You won't always know if you're near limestone, chalk, or borax until you get your first pickaxe, since it isn't always the top layer. And since stone sacks so much more than wood, it's kind of less of a problem to go on long treks to bring back quarried stone of whatever type you want to build with, as opposed to wood. Well, everyone, that is all of the 20 questions you've submitted, and I think I've actually caught up, finally. I guess I should go check Discord and YouTube now, shouldn't I? Hmm, yeah, probably. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the answers to your questions, and I look forward to answering the next set. Let's get back into the game. Okay, folks, I think, given that we are not going to be able to see anything new on the map because of the snow, and the fact that this just has food and forage, I think I'm going to skip this ruin up here. We'll come back to that at a later time, maybe. But for now, I think I'm going to count my blessings, which include most of my blood. I still have most of it, if not all of it. And we are going to start the trek home which is not that way. So, I am going to head home. We will unload all of our stuff into our chests or our trunks, 
and then we will come back and talk about them and enjoy our spoils together. So I'll see all of you when we're home, safe and sound and hopefully warm and not caught in bushes. And hopefully I'll be alive. Oh, hello. Pink apple tree branch and apple tree stem. It's a weird one. We're going to help you guys grow a little bit. Okay. Well, I'll see all of you in a little bit. Wild mountains over there. All right, everyone. Welcome home. We made it back without any more bear maulings. I actually ended up swimming for part of it because I, well, I fell in the water. It was deeper than I thought. I was already soaking wet, and I figured, hey, what the heck. And we are still not freezing yet. Actually, we're... I think we're actually going up. I think I was at 36 point something earlier. Anyway, we are back, and I have put everything that we got into this trunk. And I've separated it by things we found versus things we bought. So, what we found. We got a copper pickaxe, which is pretty darn cool. Really handy, just, you know, extra pickaxe. Nothing to sneeze at. We got four parsnip seeds and seven cabbage seeds. That is, I think it doubles, yes, that doubles our current cabbage seed stock. That is amazing. The parsnips I don't care about so much, but I do want to grow them next year to show you kind of why I don't like them. We got seven flax twine and seven flax fibers, which basically means 8.75 flax twine. There we go. We got one tuning cylinder with the song Quirky Tavern. And at some point, we'll need to go and find a resonator to play it. We got eight pear tree cuttings, nine pink apple tree cuttings, and three cherry tree cuttings. Seven feathers, 11 rusty gears, or so. I kind of lost track of how many we got, so it's about 11, though, because we spent 11 on all of this stuff. We also got four horsetail poultices from Linen. This is one of the upgrades to the poultices we have here. So these give us two hit points, these give you four. There is a bigger, batter one that gives you seven. And actually two. There's one that gives you three, made of twine, like this. So these give you three hit points. There's also one made of linen, honey, and sulfur that gives you seven. And one that's made of this stuff, along with some very heavily distilled alcohol, that also gives you seven. Lastly, we have the things that we purchased, which is eight linen for eight gears total, which I think is a pretty good deal given that we are in the early game. I am, I want to get as much linen as we can. And also some woolen leggings. And I bought these because these are among the warmest leggings you can get in the game. They're not as stylish as our clockmaker stuff, but they'll keep us a little bit warmer. And they're also already in good condition, so win-win. So we now have three, six, ten, 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 11 and a half degrees of protection against the cold. And at some point I may look at replacing our apron and our shirt here. We could get probably another one, two, three, four, five, five or six-ish protection from our clothing. So that might be worth it if I can find some that is worth buying or crafting. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and put all this away. I'm going to probably, oh, I know what we're going to do. Before I put all that away, we have leather out here. Yes, yes, yes. And we have plenty of room to carry it, too. So, those five huge hides turned into 25 leather. That is a great haul. Now, with the other hide sizes, you might not end up with a multiplier that equals 25. So, like, the medium hides, I think, give you two each. Or maybe it's three each. So, you can only get, like, 24 out of that, that will leave you with a little bit of liquid left in these barrels. These huge hides, however, left nothing, because each of these huge hides being turned into leather uses up 10 liters exactly. So we now have three completely empty barrels here. But what we can do with this now is we can make, finally, <laughs> finally, 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 we can make a better bow. <laughs> Boy, has this been a long time coming. So downstairs, I have the remains of that bear from last episode. Let's get two of these, and then we're going to plug you back up, and we need some bones. I think that was, what, two bones, right? Yep, two bones, and we need three of the flex twine we just got. There we go. So, we need this, and 
this, and this, and there we go. A recurve bow that does one more or 0.75 more damage, has almost three times the durability, and has a plus 30% accuracy buff to it. So you'll see now, let's say we're going to use... Do we have a nice, easy block? You know what? Let's shoot the painting. I know we shouldn't shoot the painting, but let's shoot the painting. So from from back here, if I sit down, we can shoot the painting. And it's at least... Well, we're getting some drop. But that's five shots, one of which destroy the arrow. But check out the grouping. So that's pretty close together, at least all in the same half meter area. Let's try it with our other bow. So we'll get out to it was here, and we'll do it again. So you'll see that the simple bow is just not nearly as accurate. The groupings are a little bit wider. And of course, the more range you have, the bigger difference that is. So I'm going to keep the simple bow. We'll put it away here in case we need it as a backup. But this is going to be our main bow for a while. And I may actually make a bunch of these and a bunch of the long bows, because if we find a treasure hunter trader, I think it is, we can sell these to them at a pretty decent price, between 7 and 10 gears. Now, as for our leather, I'm going to go ahead and put it away here. I am going to start making some more leather, and the way we're going to do that is eventually we're going to go and get some more lime. But we're not going to do that today, because we have one more thing I want to get to today before we call it quits, and that is I want to go to, or through, both of our translocators, and I want to visit the traders on the other side, as well as maybe visit any potential ruins. But I don't think we saw any here or up here. I think you're... There it is. Ah, we had two ruins here. Okay. See, so yeah, I want to go visit these traders and see what they are, because I kind of consider them to be neighbors because it's such a short trip to go and visit them. Let's just go to the translocators, we'll drill to the surface, and then we'll be there. So, I'm going to make some more food, I'm going to get a rest, and then we're going to head through the translocators and drill upwards, bringing some ladders with us to get to the surface, and we'll go see who the traders are. Good morning to everyone. It has been a night, a night that I spent panning all of that bony soil that I had, picked up from other ruins along the way, and before we go and visit our other traders through the TLs, I thought we should take a look at what we got, because we got some good stuff. We got two lore books. One is dark gray, and one is dark beige, both aged, of course. We got a tuning cylinder from this bunny soil with cultured tavern. Some bunny rib cages, some flint arrowheads, a bunch of bones. We got enough flax to make an entire piece of linen and one more piece of twine, which is great. We got our very first nugget of silver which is pretty cool. Five more arrowheads, two more spearheads, more rough peridots and some emeralds, a temporal gear, which yes, you can get from bony soil, and one more candle. All in all, this is a pretty darn good haul. Now we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna read these lore books. We got Breakdown, it is one part, and we get Letters, part one of eight. We'll go ahead and open the journal. And you want to read Breakdown, you can. And Letters 1 of 8, you can. Go ahead and pause it and give those a look-see. Anyway, you all aren't here to watch me go through our treasure again. You are here because we're going to go and visit these other traders through the TLs that we have found. So, yeah, we'll be fine. All right, folks, here we are. And I already went back down and took a tippy-tap, and there is literally no ore in this area. <laughs> so, yep, I'm not going to find anything yummy here. What are you, good sir, or madam, commodities <laughs> trader? Yes. Yes, yes, Jasper. Oh, you're going to be a very... Ooh, oh, four gears per crate? I got two days. I'm. I'll be back here to... Yeah. Yep. He's got more. These are square and diamond stitches, though. I don't know if we can do anything with these. Linen normal stitches. You know, I don't know if we can do 
normal things with these different stitched linens. Could be worth exploring. Yeah, they do have sulfur, though. That could be fun. And saltpeter? Mmm. And he's got to consider it for sale. So, yeah, this is good to know. So, they'll buy aged crates and they'll buy cracked vessels. Now, these are things that we find in ruins. And we aren't a malefactor, so we can't pick them up. And even they only have a 12% chance of picking up a broken, cracked vessel. However, you can buy these from treasure hunter traders. So if you find one of those guys, if you buy low and sell high, you can make a really, really nice profit on cracked vessels. I will come back and sell some aged crates in a couple days, but that is all we're going to do with him for now. Him or, or her or them. Anyway, oh right, I should probably mark you. Jasper. Okay, well, let's get back in here, and then we're going to go through the other translocator, and we're going to see what the merchant near that one is. And we're also going to clear some of this junk so I can see where the heck our ladder is. There you are. Okay, folks, here we are. Leaving a little bit of a ladder tip sticking out here. There we go, and we're like the exact same distance from this trader as we were from the one in the other TL. I think it's a conspiracy. Let's see what you are. You are another furniture trader. Okay. Not too bad. Felipe. Okay, well, we've seen one of you earlier today, so good to know. Oh, and you're selling an iron door. When it comes time to make iron doors, I... Honestly, if you have enough gears, I recommend just buying them. You'll see why. Much later. Much, much later. Anyway, everyone, I think that's about all the time we have for this episode of the Vintage Story Guide. I hope you enjoyed my answers to your 20 questions as we traveled across the land and met all of our neighbors that we've seen on the map before. As well as dug up um, our old neighbors, the ones we didn't meet. I do think that in the next episode, it'll be high time for us to go ahead and get some animals going on. But then I'm thinking about seeking out some tin to get into the Bronze Age soon. So look forward to some fun animal wrangling in the next episode. And then some tin gathering probably in the episode after, unless anything else pops up. I could also maybe explore around down here before it gets too snowy. Maybe. As always, my name is Kurazar. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.